as the strains of Thy Kingdom Come, O God, Thy Rule, O Christ, begin, fade away, may I offer you a very warm welcome to our podcast this morning. Uh, We recommend that you find somewhere quiet and somewhere peaceful, just so that we can spend a time together and tune into what God might be saying to our souls this morning. So let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that you give us the opportunity to become part of your kingdom, loved by you, part of your family. And as we pray this morning, we recognise that there are millions of people all over the world who might be doing something very similar. Lord, you are creating a people for yourself, a great community. But Father, I pray particularly this morning for those who are listening to this very much on their own who are feeling separated from those they love and separated from the community of faith that they're used to joining together with, maybe on a Sunday morning. Father, we pray that you give them a sense of being part of a much bigger group of people, a community of love, your people, Lord. And Father, we're going to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us now, which seeks for the coming of the kingdom. Let's pray, shall we? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Well, the theme of our reading today, our gospel reading from the lectionary, is very much focused on the kingdom of God. And uh, it's from Matthew 13. We're moving our way through. If you remember last week, we had the parable of the sower. Well, today we are looking at the parable of the wheat. And as the authorised version calls it, the tares. And Mike's going to lead us in that now. Our gospel reading comes from the Gospel of St Matthew, chapter 13, verses 24 to 30 and 36 to 43. So we hear the complete parable of the weeds among the wheat. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest time I'll tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first, and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evil doers, and they will be thrown into the furnace of fire, where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let everyone with ears listen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When Jesus started his ministry, He came and called people to repentance, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And quite a lot of his ministry was spent telling us a little bit more about what this kingdom is going to be like. We should remember, of course, that God rules over not only heaven, but the earth as well. Uh, He rules over all because, of course, he is the creator of the earth. We say that God is sovereign. He is the final word. He has all authority and power. 
we see as far as this world is concerned that God mediates his rule through usually people. We start off seeing God giving Adam and Eve the responsibility of subduing the earth and looking after it. So God is ruling, if you like, through them as co-regents. And this idea comes through again and again, whether it be through the patriarchs like Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, or whether it be through the prophets or whether it be through the kings. And of course, Jesus himself is God's son. He is the ruler of the earth and God sends his son to redeem those who had fallen from grace. And likewise, in the time of the church, which is what we're in now, and we're given the responsibility of bringing something of God's kingdom or God's rule into the world now. And we as well pick up this responsibility for being stewards of God's creation, something which is very pertinent in our time of global warming. The Bible shows us that in God's eternal sovereign purposes, he gives Satan a measure of freedom. And he also gives sinners a measure of freedom too. We're given free will to do that which we choose, whether it be good or whether it be bad. Well, we've talked about the fact that we're in the age of the church now. And technically, this stretches from the point where Christ was rejected to when he comes again, his second coming, which has been a long part of Christian doctrine. And a characteristic of this church age, as with regards to the kingdom, is it's a, well, it's a now but not yet kingdom. There are some aspects of the kingdom which are here and now unfulfilled, but there are some which are yet to come to pass. Some theologians call this the mystery form of the king. Mystery, not in you can't understand it, but that this concept of the church age appeared to be hidden in the Old Testament, but is revealed in the New. That's how the New Testament uses the word mystery, the bringing to light of something that was hidden. Jesus, in his parables, is telling us a lot, though, about what this already but not yet kingdom is like. And we find that there are seven clear parables of the kingdom which tell us about what the character of the kingdom is, what its extent is going to be, and the value of the kingdom, and of course its ultimate consummation. Most of the Old Testament prophecies about the coming of Christ and the coming of the kingdom have an immediate feel about them that when the king comes he will destroy the wicked and all the enemies of God will be disposed of and righteousness and glory will fill the earth. These prophecies are all about cleansing and judgment. And yet here we are in this church age, which is a time not of judgment, but of grace, a time of forgiveness. Much of Jesus' teachings to his disciples was about the kingdom. And even after his resurrection, we find that in the book of Acts, before Jesus ascends into heaven, they are still learning about the kingdom. And the disciples still want to know when will the ultimate fulfilment of the kingdom come? Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom? And Jesus tells them that it's not for them to know the day or the hour, but that, that information is reserved to God himself. Much of the teaching in the kingdom parables is concerned with what will happen at the return of Christ, at the fulfilment of all things. And many of these parables are parables about separation, about one being taken, another being left. We can think about Jesus teaching about the sheep being separated from the goats, or the wheat from the chaff, or the good fish from the bad fish, or the fruitful branches from the unfruitful branches. We find that from God's perspective, there are two sorts of people. There are those that are his and that there are those that are not his. And in the wonderful painting that is uh, hopefully on your screen now, which comes from a church in Washington, we see the coming of Christ and two groups of people, those who have been looking for his coming and are delighted to see him. And there are those which are turning away, who are horrified to find that Jesus has come. 
the scriptures talk about people again in two categories as those who are Christ's who look to him and those who are under the influence of the evil one. Well, it may go against our modern sensibilities to suggest that many people, if you like, serve Satan, <laughs> certainly not consciously. But Martin Luther talks about the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, as Paul talks in Ephesians 2, uh, as this. He gives some of the characteristics. The God of this world is riches, pleasure and pride. So we know many people probably who worship the God of this world because what they're really interested in is riches, seeking after riches, wealth, pleasure and pride. So we have a world of believers and unbelievers. Not everyone believes. But we're encouraged, of course, to seek God's kingdom first and his righteousness and all these good things in life will be added unto us. So the kingdom of God, in its fullness, is a kingdom of absolute glory and absolute righteousness. There is no darkness, no sin, no evil in it whatsoever. Now, if God is going to establish a kingdom of purity, glory and righteousness, it means that everything that doesn't conform to God's holiness must be removed and destroyed if we're going to, for example, clean a room really well, well, you have to remove the dirt. You don't just forgive the dirt for being there. You get out your cleaning implements and you scrub away and you remove and you wash it away. And then you have your clean room. The coming of Jesus is the coming of the king. And he's also the judge of all the earth as well. So when Jesus comes a second time, it's not the time of forgiveness and grace. It's the time of cleansing and judgment, of separating those which are his from those which are not. Paul, in his second letter to the Thessalonians, describes Jesus' second coming, saying, When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Well, this is strong stuff. And Jesus came to save us from this, to save us from the penalty of our sins. Interestingly, in the uh, Nicene Creed, we read, of course, that Jesus is going to come again, and it says to judge the quick and the dead, a time of judgment. Well, the parable of the wheat and the weeds or the wheat and the tares that we've read today is a parable of the kingdom, but it is also primarily a parable of judgment. The tares were, in fact, a form of wheat called darnel. And the importance of this in the parable is that darnel is often called false wheat. While it's growing, it looks exactly like the ordinary sort of wheat. It's only when the seed head, the grain head, starts to form that we see the difference. With the wheat we get those lovely grains of wheat from which we get our flour. But the darnel produces something quite different. It produces seeds and if those seeds in fact are allowed to go mouldy slightly they, they become highly toxic indeed. So they're counterfeit wheat. Counterfeit wheat. Many commentators suggest that the field in which these seeds are sown, the good seeds by Jesus and the bad seeds by the devil, uh, is the church. But really that doesn't hold true if we read the whole of the account here. Jesus describes the field as being the world. It's his world, the world that he has created. Two sorts of people again those who belong to Christ and those that don't. And the key here, of course, and this comes through Jesus' teaching as well upon being fruitful, that you can tell ultimately the difference between the tares and the wheat by the fruit that they bear. Jesus said in Matthew 7, by their fruits you shall know them. And in Matthew 12, a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. In the time of Jesus, the oversowing of a crop with Darnell was seen as a very serious criminal act. It had the power to destroy the crop, or at least radically reduce its usability. 
these days we have the technology to when we take the grain to separate out the grain that is good and the darnel grain which is bad but in those days it could end up producing flour which was toxic for consumption well in the parable the angels recognize that the enemy has sown these tares and ask for permission to go in amongst them and remove them from the crop but jesus says no leave them alone and we're in this church age where in the world we have both wheat and tares intermingled together. And that is how God has ordained it to be for the present. The removal of the tares would be an act of judgment. And today is not a day of judgment, but a day of grace. Jesus warns us against judging other people. And the church itself has often committed great sins by judging others to be tares in its history and persecuting them, often later to find that, well, they weren't tares at all. They were the wheat, and the church had committed the sin of destroying wheat, true believers, rather than sinners. Well, remembering that this is a parable of judgment, we then find what happens at the end of the age, and that is when Jesus returns and we see that the reapers of the harvest are the angels. They are God's agents doing his bidding. And they gather the good wheat into the barn and they separate out the tares and bundle them up. The day of grace is over. The day of judgment has arrived. And the bundles of tares, we're told, are burned. So this coming day of the Lord, spoken of so much in the Old Testament and the New, it's a day of judgment, a day of putting things right, a day of removing sin and sinners from God's kingdom. The Bible speaks much about people who resist what God has to say, those who will not repent, those who will not believe, and those who love their sin and will not let it go, those who will not come to the light but prefer darkness. Well, God allows us our free will. He allows us to make the decisions that we choose to make. But he also reminds us that every choice that we make in life has its consequences. But God's message is clear. He will burn up the chaff. He will remove the weeds. He will purify his people because he is building a kingdom of total purity, holiness, glory and righteousness. At the end of the parable, after the wheat has been brought in together and the tares have been disposed of, Jesus says, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. To emphasise the importance of the message, Jesus ends the parable with the famous phrase, going from the authorised version, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, pay really close attention to this. This is very important indeed. This truly is a picture of what is going to happen when I come again. Well, as last week we asked the question, what sort of soil are we? I suppose the similar question this week is, am I a wheat or am I a weed? Am I a fruitful planting of God or am I following the prince of this world seeking after wealth and power and fame. Not wanting to stretch the parable too far, but in a sense, the Bible tells us that, well, we all started off as tares, all started off as weeds, but that what Jesus does is he takes us in our weed form and transforms us into wheat. So if you feel that in your life you're still a weed, then the gospel of Jesus says, if you believe in me, I will transform you from a worthless weed into a wonderful plant of God, bringing forth true spiritual fruit. And I trust all of you who hear this message that you may understand and you may seek God while he may be found that we may realise that it is today that is the day of salvation, that this, today is the day of grace, 
that now is the time to seek God's mercy and transforming power. I pray that we do that. And so to our prayers of intercession, which Mike is going to lead us today. And so to our prayers of intercession. Father, we look out of our windows and as the months roll by, we've witnessed flowers and pollinators, flowers bursting open and pollinators busy flying around flower to flower. And we wonder at it. Many of our favourite plants come from foreign climates. And if we think about peoples from those same places, then we're ashamed. Because often we fail to appreciate them as much as we do the plants in our garden. So help us. Help us, Father, to love, care, nurture, treasure and feed all people without discrimination of race or colour to appreciate them as much as we do ourselves. Father, you have set your church in the world and you've given to us your great commission to proclaim the imminence of your kingdom. We pray for your continued blessing on Mark as he cares for us with such care, seeking only the best for our faith and well-being. May we find a new song to sing of your wondrous mercy and grace, that by your fruit in our lives, good seed can be sown in our neighbourhood. Help us not to be overwhelmed by circumstances, particularly those that seem to grow around us and make us uncomfortable or restrict our horizons. There are many of us who are sick and caring for the sick, And now we call out to you the names of those we love and care for. Members of our fellowship. Members of our family. Our neighbours. And our friends. As we gather, the Lord is present with healing mercies. May our bodies, minds and souls be anointed. We pray for discernment, that we may clearly differentiate weeds and healthy grain, that we can see and be led in clear ministry one to another, that our faith can continue to be fed and nurtured, so that we may bear fruitful witness to you, our Lord and Saviour. We pray for all who have died, remembering particularly those who have given selflessly caring for the sick, yet enduring COVID and death. We remember the families devastated by such loss. We give thanks for all the saints who go before us, who ensured that the gospel seed was planted and nurtured in our lives, giving us the support and encouragement to grow into strong faith. Lord, We ask these prayers in your name. Amen. Do you remember at the start of our time together, we had the tune to the hymn, Thy Kingdom Come, O God. And we're going to use the words of that hymn as our closing prayer. Thy kingdom come, O God. Thy rule, O Christ, begin. Break with thine iron rod the tyrannies of sin. Where is thy reign of peace and purity and love, when shall all hatred cease, as in the realms above? When comes the promised time, that war shall be no more, oppression, lust, and crime shall flee thy face before? We pray thee, Lord, arise, and come in thy great might, revive our longing eyes, which languish for thy sight. O lands both near and far, thick darkness broodeth yet, Arise, O morning star, arise and never set. Lord, we wait for your coming glory. And Father, as we do so, we pray that the light of your countenance might shine upon us and give us peace in the knowledge that we are yours. Amen. Till we meet again. (laughs) 